वी आर लाइव इन फाइव फोर थ्री टू वन वी आर लाइव नाउ थैंक यू सो मच ऑर्थो टीवी एंड उत्तरांचल ऑर्थोपेडिक एसोसिएशन आई ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ इंडियन आर्थोप्लास्टी एसोसिएशन वेलकम यू ऑल टू दिस वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट वेबिनार विच विल बी वेरी यूजफुल फॉर आर यंग ऑर्थोपेडिक सर्जन्स और आर बडिंग आर्थोप्लास्टी सर्जन्स वी हैव ए वेरी वेरी एक्सपीरियंस फैकल्टी स्पीकिंग इन दिस मीटिंग इन दिस वेबिनार मीटिंग Uh, and uh, it is this webinar is uh, in association with the uttaranchal orthopedic association uh, thank you so much dr gaurav and uh, before Welcome. any delay uh, i'll request dr gaurav to give a little bit of introduction and mm. start the webinar dr gaurav yes sir so good evening everyone and i Uh, Dr. Gaurav Gupta, welcome the all the eminent uh, speakers from Indian Arthroplasty Association. Uh, Dr. Rajiv Sharma, Dr. Majubada, Dr. Uh, Rakesh Rajput, Dr. Mohanty, and Dr. Uh, Devrat. Uh, it's going to be very important uh, meeting uh, as far as arthroplasty uh, talks uh, uh, are being there in most of the webinar, but. today we are going to discuss some very important uh, uh so all uh, budding orthoplasticians as well as experienced orthoplasticians and there will be uh, a series of lectures from uh, all the eminent party uh, and uh, there will be a question answer session on will you are breaking garo sorry to interrupt garo sir have, have you joined from two devices anyway there is some uh, uh, interrupted uh, signals from dr garo sir so i'll uh, just take over and i'm sure that he'll join back uh, us with the proper connection very soon so this important webinar that we have it on the uh, on the tips and tricks for a successful total knee arthroplasty and i've been asked to speak uh, first on this uh, this webinar and discuss uh, with you the tips for a successful knee arthroplasty and i think that uh, Uh, tips for a for a successful knee arthroplasty uh, are uh, are very important hello yes yes hmm. dr gaurav uh i lost the connection it's uh, okay yeah. ha so uh, our first speaker uh, dr ajit sharma and in north west association and he is a very amazing about on 10 commandment for a successful knee orthoplasty so sir hello yes sir hello. thank you dr gaurav thank you dr gaurav uh, we understand that the connection on your side is is slightly interrupted so i'll just take on from here and will speak on the 10 commandments for a successful knee arthroplasty and uh, for for our younger colleagues if you follow these few simple principles of the knee arthroplasty you will not have many dissatisfied patients uh, because we must know that one in five patients after total knee arthroplasty are not as satisfied as we expect them to be there are various reasons for that pain stiffness instability infection and uh, uh, many other reasons that we will discuss in 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 next few slides so if we follow these basic principles uh, the tips and tricks it will be very fine first is the assessment of the patient 
sterile and disciplined operating environment, free of free of preparation of the patient, per operative adequate exposure, proper bone cuts and alignment in all coronal, sagittal and rotational al alignment should be good. Post offset should be seen. There should be good posterior clearance and the joint should be stable. And the joint, patellofemoral joint should be a balanced patellofemoral joint. There should not be too much of rotation of laterally or internally. And there should be a good cementing, which is very, very important. And then we see the pain management and rehabilitation of the patient. In the patient assessment, if we see the psychological assessment is very important, justified expectations and discuss with the family. Gate assessment, the gate tells a lot, especially when the patient is going away from you. That is the right approach of seeing the patient. Skin any previous scars of the high table osteotomy or any implant fixation and what kind of a deformity, whether this deformity is correctable or not correctable, how much the laxity patient has, and that's, that's how you see this patient is having the medial, uh, significant medial uh, osteoarthrosis on the X-ray. But if you see the patient, there is clearly visible hyperextension of the knee. So you know that this patient is not just the medial osteoarthritis, but also having the laxity, the, the hyperextension. So you will have to plan the cuts accordingly. The operating environment and the pre-operative preparation of the patient uh, is very important. I prepare my patient from toes to the groin with the proper adhesive uh, sterile ioben applied in the perineal area so that perineal area is separated up. The both legs can be done simultaneously, prepared very safely. In the, in the uh, center, we put a small ioben so that even if the patient passes urine because of some reason, uh, during the surgery, because a long, it may be a long surgery, you should be, the operative and environment should be protected. There should be adequate exposure. Very, very important thing. Whenever you are trying to do with a small cut, you can commit many more mistakes than with a proper adequate exposure. Use mobile window concept. Do not try to stretch the tissues because under anesthesia, you will be able to stretch the tissues but later on, there will be a problem of the wound healing and also the pain. Exposure should be, uh, should be done very carefully. The patella should be subluxated as, as what you see here. You should not try to stretch the, the tissues using the, uh, using the Hohmann's retractors. Carefully retract as much as much is required, not more than that and the judicious release of the MCL, which I'm sure that the subsequent speakers will talk a lot about it, and their tips and tricks that how much the release should be done. Bone cuts and alignment is very important. I operate from, operate from the foot side of the patient, so I can see a very clear alignment of my patients. You see that, that uh, when, you, when, you saw, when you are using the saw, you should be very, very careful because it should not happen that you are, your saw is going beyond the, the limit of the bone. Use the limited planned instrumentation. Bone cuts and alignment should be planned well. And you should always cross-check. It is not necessary that you only in robotic or in the computer-navigated surgery, you should recheck or you should cross-check. Even with the proper normal instrumentation, you can cross-check very easily, your, especially the distal femoral cut and the uh, the tibial cut, which are very, very important cuts. Rotational alignment is very important. It should be as per the transepicondylar axis, and you should be able to adjust it if it is needed. This kind of a gap you should expect in all your patients in flexion and also the, the quadrilateral gap in extension also. And make adjustments if it is needed. For example, if you see this patient, the transepicondylar line and the pins are not parallel to each other. So you don't need a computer navigation for this. You can just put the additional pin and you can, you can balance the, uh, the joint in flexion accordingly very easily. And that this, these small tricks will help you a lot in having a well-balanced joint in extension as well as in flexion. It is very important that you clear the joint posteriorly. 
the subsequent speakers will talk a lot about it, the how to how the release is done. The basics are that the clearance should be good. You use the laminar spreader, which are used for the spine very successfully and a curved acetone so that the proper posterior clearance is done. The joint should look like this when you in flexion. If you see this, the, the joint is not having the sufficient opening medially. And, and, for, and to make sure that this, uh, this, prop, this is properly uh, balanced, uh, you release the tissues, posterior medial corner should be released. And later on, you will see uh, that uh, the joint is uh, reasonably well balanced when the extension is done after the sufficient release. And that's how you see. And of course, you see that the extension gap is lesser. So you will cut more tibia or femur, whatever is as per the requirement of that particular condition. The joint should be stable. That is a very important thing that even if there is a mild mistake in uh, whereas the, the tibial cut or the femoral cut, the, the, the problem is that if the joint is unstable, it will be a major issue for this part of the patient. And especially the joint un, unbalanced inflection. If it is loose inflection, patient will, will find it difficult to get up from the sitting position. You see that define the anteroposterior femur cut judiciously parallel to the transepicondylar axis, no stuffing of the patellofemoral joint and patellar retinacular release if it is needed. Component malrotation could be a hidden culprit. So that is a very important thing to be seen. You see example, this patient who shows a very good uh, uh, knee in the AP and lateral views. But if you see the skyline view, you see that the patella is not just subluxated, it is almost dislocated. So this patient cannot be a happy patient. Acceptable, what is the acceptable neutral femoral component rotation? No internal rotation relative to the surgical transepicondylar axis and up to five degrees of external rotation is acceptable. Unacceptable rotation, malrotation, when you have more than two degrees of either component or more than three degrees of combined component. Tibial rotation is to some extent looked after in a mobile bearing joint, which I use quite frequently. And then you see that this patient, even if the tibia is in a, in a malrotated position, the mobile bearing part of the implant can look after this very well. What you need finally is this kind of a picture where transepicondylar axis is parallel to the anterior and posterior femoral cuts and also the tibial cut and the flexion and extension spaces are well balanced and also the ligaments are in the normal tension, not too tight and not too lax. And balanced joint in flexion, extension and mid flexion is what is the aim of the surgery. Once you do this, and if your finger is the best judge, you just touch the MCL. If you find that the MCL is tight, you know that your, your, your balancing needs to be, uh, you have to put more efforts to balance this joint. Name alignment in sagittal plane is important. You use the, the when you start the cut, use the, uh, the medial edge of the lateral uh, articular surface of the tibia that is relating to almost one third of the, of the, uh, the, the junction of middle third and, and, uh, uh, and mid third of the tibial uh, fibrosity. And you, uh, you, uh, you measure it up with the uh, center of the tibia. And then you see that you can have a very well uh, balanced cut. And at every step, you must keep cross-checking your, your uh, cuts. So that is a very, very important aspect. Alignment in coronal plane, as we have just discussed, it should be uh, the, the joint should not be tight, should not be loose also, and the space should be well balanced. Tibial cut, femoral cut, and also tibial tray positioning, all these three things will, dif will differentiate. You see here a very good example of my own patient, long back. Uh, if you see that the femoral component is in uh, rotation, and that is how, why this patient is having a limited flexion and he's fighting for the movements. When you see this patient who has a good rotation of the femoral component in relation to the transepicondylar axis and about the tibial cut, you see and, and a, and a well-balanced joint, this patient passes the litmus test that patient can stand up from the sitting position 
without using the hands. And good cementing is very important. The cement should embed four to five millimeter into the bone, and that is what is what is a good cementing. You can use these the various types of the skin closer. I use the monocryl sutures these days. Pain control and rehabilitation program is very very important trick to have a successful surgery. You see this patient on the second day of the surgery. Patient is able to extend almost fully and having the ninety degree flexion of all all my patients. And that is what is our routine in almost all the patients. We have a second day or first day itself ninety to hundred degrees flexion and almost a full extension. You see this patient. Bending the knee on the second day of the the surgery or third day of the surgery, now that is a routine for our patients. On the seventh day, this patient is able to bend the knee significantly, uh, and the right knee that was done ten years back by myself is having excellent function. That's what you see. These patients can do at one month, at three months, and all this is related to. How well balanced your joint is, how how proper cuts you have made. You see this previous surgical scar, stiff knee with thirty degree fixed flexion deformity. You see this patient. This patient at nineteen year follow up, uh, the LCS joint of my own, and having an excellent stability. There is no loose signs of the loosening at 19 years. Revision joints similarly perform equally well. What you see here. Now that's the patient after revision TKR on 12th day of the surgery. Good function, like what you see all these patients. And what is very important is the last, but the most important trick is that you recognize your complication early. Now this patient who had a fracture of the medial condyle for operative was fixed at the same time uh, with the with the two screws and that's what you see this patient at a follow up of almost nine years and having the excellent union and no lo no loosening or signs of a problem. This patient of unicondylar surgery, uh, I had the fracture on the table, but if you recognize it in time, you will have an excellent function with time. Recognize that this kind of a situation, what you see is not actually the infection, but it is actually the loose joint inflection. And that's how what you see is that there is a, a full, uh, full rotation of the poly. And this patient uh, became absolutely all right by just changing the height of the poly. And this patient did excellent. So this is very important that you recognize the problem uh, soon after the surgery, on the table, or in the during the follow-up, infection should be recognized very carefully. You see this patient of instable, uh, instability with the proper surgery. You know that you can balance this joint very well. So just to repeat all the, all the simple tricks, you assess patient well, a good sterile, disciplined operating environment, per operative follow all the all the uh, steps that we discussed post-operatively control the pain and recognize complications early. And that's how you will be able to have a successful knee surgery. Pre-op preparation, preemptive analgesia, good surgical principles, intraarticular infiltration, multimodal analgesia, and, and as much as possible, you try to keep the patient uh, comfortable and follow the patient for every step. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'll, I'll Thank conclude. I'll, yeah, I'll conclude with this: that stability in extension, mid flexion, and ninety degree flexion is important. Prevention of infection is the highest priority. Alignment, both in sagittal and coronal planes, for both femoral and tibial components, is important. And with this, follow all these principles and further steps that my colleagues will will discuss in their in their talks will ensure that you have a successful surgery. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rajiv. Excellent uh, talk covering entire gamut of, uh, you know, totally orthoplasty, what are do's, do nots, and uh, how to avoid complications and how to have a successful total knee replacement. Friends, uh, I'm Dr. Pant here. Sorry for being late. Now, Welcome, sir. Uh, 
Uh, we'll take one or two questions while uh, Dr. Rakesh Rajput is sharing his screen. Actually, mm -hmm. Dr. Rajput on his way to Pune and I think he's waiting at the airport and he's joining from the airport itself at Kolkata. Yeah. He'll talk us about gap balancing and measured resection, the basic principles, which is always confusing. Uh, any questions to Dr. Rajiv in the meantime? One or two questions we can take and uh, have a vivid discussion later on. Uh, uh, hello. Hello. Yeah. Yeah, please go on. Was that Sanjeev, is it? I think hello. there is some uh, audio issue. Or, or we can have a discussion at the hello. end of all the hello. talks. Yeah, yeah, we can finish Dr. Rakesh talk, then we'll have a discussion. Okay. So, Rakesh, am I audible? Please. Yes. Yeah, so if I become inaudible, stop me at that because I won't know if I'm inaudible. Um, so, I think the yeah, yeah. talk uh, which was given to me was gap balancing and measure resection. I think what you saw, Dr. Rajiv, showing all these uh, techniques was basically about measure resection. But uh, there is something more which has come more and more into vogue now, which is called the gap balancing technique. So we'll just go through from that. Um, we talk about balance. Uh, if you ask different surgeons, uh, you know, what balance actually means, and you'll get very different answers. So what I understand by balance is uh, that you have a soft tissue envelope enough to give you support for all the physiological activities, and it is not tight to limit your knee movements or cause pain or give you stiffness. And I think if you can achieve that, that's about call balance. Now, how that translates into your operation, this is a bit debatable. So, uh, Raji showed you very nice slides that if you have a rectangular gap uh, in extension and if you have inflection, everything should be very hunky dory. Uh, I wish that was true, uh, but it doesn't still always uh, happen like that. So, where is this answer? Where are we still uh, not able to equate that? Now, if you do robotic surgeries, and uh, a lot of people are now beginning to do that. This is what uh, normally you're, you're aiming for, that you have an equal balance uh, gap on flexion, you have equal balance gap on extension, and you have it on medial side, and you have it on the lateral side. The question is, is that what you're trying to replicate for a normal knee? Now, if you look at the balance structures or the kinematics of a normal knee, particularly when you are on the lateral side in flexion, that knee opens up. And a cadaveric experiments have been done to actually show that. Now, if you see the medial side, even with stress uh, and uh, different degrees of flexion, the gap doesn't vary much. Maximum, it comes to about two mm of uh, gaps. But if you look at the lateral side, even four, five, six mm, can it, it can open up. So what are we trying to achieve in our operation if you have to match these sort of laxities? So not every patient will be very happy if we make them exactly equal on both front back. But we don't know which patient needs what. So I think it's very important to identify which are those lax patients and which are the tight patients? The tight patients, you can mean leave them minimal lax, particularly in flexion on the lateral side. But whereas if they are lax patients, they will require a bit more laxity because they are used to it. They won't like a tight knee at all. So don't tighten up a lax patient. So this is beginning to start. The question is, how do we go about this? So there are various ways we do soft tissue balancing. This is what we are trying to achieve. Let me talk to you about the two principal methods. One is measure dissection. The other one is a gap balancing. And there's a third one is basically a combination of both. And if you look at the way the, uh, surgeons actually talk about this and what surgeons do on the table, it's actually a mixture of the both the methods. That's what most people do. But let me just make a bit more brief about what we do measure. I think Rajiv has already told you very well that uh, the measured section, you define how much of a TBI you're going to take. So if it's a standard typical osteoarthritic, you might take nine or 10 mm of TBI. If it's a rheumatoid, you might take less. And then you basically independently cut the femur based on your traceptic condylar axis or white side line uh, or the tibial cut or the posterior condylar axis. The question is, is this very safe? But if you look very carefully, many times you have a very superficial notch. You can't even define the white side line carefully. People have tried to identify the traceptic condylar axis and 30 to 40% times you get it wrong. Then you try to do posterior condylar axis and even that can be wrong because that itself is actually uh, not right. Uh, parallel to the tibial axis. Then if you have a condition, which I think Manoj will talk more about a valgus knee, there the condyles are so hyperplastic that it will actually offset you completely. So the posterior condyle offset also cannot be relied on. Next comes the cut tibia. 
that is why rajiv was telling you that do the tbr first take your time cut it really well so that if you are earning in all the other three types of axes you can still fall back on the tbr so that's what we mean by a, a measured dissection so you do your cuts and then you look at the gaps how you are creating an extension gap first and then go on to the the flexion gap the other technique which is has been very popular in the long time back by freeman and then i think one of the knees which rajiv showed the lcs that was the proponents of the gap balancing techniques here what you do is you do a minimal dissection of tbr and you balance one of the gaps either flexion or extension you get that gap right and then you balance the other right so now we'll talk about the flexion gap first technique in this case what you do is you do the tbl cut and then you get your uh, ligament balances out and you measure the uh, gap which is on the flexion side and then you you do the cuts for the flexion this same cut you have to match on the extension side now if it is not matching and you have a ligament uh, imbalance that's the time when you actually would release the ligaments now remember all these cases whether you measured or gap balancing all the osteophytes are clearly taken out beforehand right so that's what you would do now in a extension gap first now why did people move into extension gap and the reason for that is if you look at whether it's a valgus knee or a varus knee the deformity is in extension so if you want to correct this deformities is the first step you want to do so you bring the leg into extension you cut the tibia and you see how much femur you have to uh, correct so that you get a rectangular extension gap so you do the soft tissue balancing first and then you do the distal femoral cut to get an extension gap then you match this gap to the flexion gap so that is the proponents of the extension gap first now where is the drawback of this and the drawback is just about what rajiv just told you that once you've done this and you've gone to flexion the amount of fiddling you will do in the posterior side has a bearing on the extension gap also if you release the capsule from the back that may uh, lengthen your extension gap you release big osteophytes from the back that may cause again a change in extension gap so it is that is why many people prefer to do the flexion gap first and then come on to the extension gap so that's about what you want at the end uh, and i think that's what it is so we've discussed two gap balancing techniques but in both of them the tbl cut is very very important and in 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 this technique it doesn't really matter how much femur you are rotating and occasionally you can get even an internal rotation uh, on the femur but because your gaps are so well balanced that the patella still will track and this is the same philosophy which the robotic surgeons also have taken over sometimes they actually rotate by one or sometimes occasionally by 2 degrees femur internally now that would be uh, condemnable if you are doing a measured dissection that you will never never be doing it but for the robotic surgeons i think occasionally even an internal rotation though preferably we all try to rotate our femurs outside now the combined technique now this is what exactly most surgeons do the people who do uh, the uh, measured dissection also go on releasing ligaments by they doing thing and also the gap balancers try to actually take out some osteophytes even uh, before they actually doing the actual cuts so that's how they would do now this is what we've been taught all throughout that ranavat balancing techniques and now we'll move on uh, most people know how to balance their knees in a um, various deformities which even rajiv showed you i'll just show you the same balancing technique how you would do apply this gap balancing into a the uh, flexion first uh, method so if you see what's going to happen and you look at any knees particularly if you look at a valgus knee when you are flexed there is no deformity and this has been well shown by dick scott that the all deformity happens mostly in extension and if you have a deformity in flexion that is a very very bad thing be careful so that is what you would come across the picture on the right side which you are seeing that the lateral side is a bit tight the middle side is a bit loose and that is in extension so this is a case so this is how the excess look like uh, this is the uh, focus views on the thing and you can see the concentric reduction on both sides it's a rheumatoid patient and a very poor bone quality so first you do is a minimal tbl dissection if you are not happy you feel that you want to cut a bit more this te- this technique allows you very well you can just turn the knobs and the sli- stylus goes down and you can actually do the cut once you've done that you now want to look at the flexion gap so this is the first thing what you are going to create is the flexion gap so it's called flexion first technique so this is the spacer which you put in you just see the spacer going in you should not be hammering too much the moment you have to hammer it a bit too much which will tight so come back and recut the tibia so reapply the jig and it's a very easy process of recutting the tibia enough to actually get that spacer in comfortably with a very gentle hammer not should slide in very easily or not should be hammered too tightly so you get your uh, tibia cut now properly done 
So next you move on to do the proper femoral cut. So here what you're looking at is the flexion gap. Now you've checked your flexion gap and you're going to do the flexion cut and also the anterior cortex cut. That's what we exactly we are doing. So we'll move on to from there. Not only you do, but you recheck. So you're now putting the spacer proc in and just as Rajiv showed you, you look at beautifully. And because this is the way the actual femur rotates, uh, matching the femur, you will actually get a very equal gap on both flexion, uh, both lateral and medial. Once you've done that, now you need to move on to the extension gap. Again, you should not be hammering. If you find it is loose, you can move it up and down. So now you're matching exactly what you've got on flexion to the extension gap. So it's a very, very, very balanced way of actually doing RT care. Once you've done that, you then move on to do the distal cut. And your distal cut is going to be very, very perfect because you've actually masked it before you even cut it. So you do the cut. I'll skip some steps. So you again check the extension gap and it is invariably going to be exactly what you've actually planned it to be. So, and now this is the place where you find if there's some tightness of where you can release it. Next, we move on to the actual creation of femur. This is not the topic we have. The tibia preparation, uh, and it's a very beautiful preparation. Raji showed you the mobile bearing knees. This is a very, very mobile knee. You have almost 25 degrees of movement uh, on either side. So this is a very mobile knee. We are preparing for stem also. And when you put in, uh, the femur won't go in until you put in the tibia and the actual thing. So the poly is first put in. On top of that, the femur goes and you get a beautiful reduction. Believe me, you try this uh, gap balancing technique and you'll find you'll be in love with this. We left in five degree of uh, uh, flexion because this is rheumatoid knee. And that's the post-op x-ray. And the beauty of this technique is also verified by the Australian registries and also by Dennis paper that if you, something, there's a phenomenon of what we call as a femoral lift off, which means that if you're tight on one side, loose on one side, the tight uh, area actually takes a lot of weight and, uh, weight and because of that, the femoral content can lift off. Now that happens more in a CR knee, slightly less in a BS knee and almost none in a gap balanced knee. And this has been well proven. So 60% almost in a CR knee, 45% uh, in a BS knee and zero, almost 0% in a, a gap balanced knee. And this is all the uh, throughout at 0, 30, 60, and 90 degrees of flexion. So it's a very beautiful way of doing a knee. Uh, I hope I have been able to clear uh, uh, some uh, doubts about the gap balancing and the measured section. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rakesh. Uh, that was a beautiful description of how you balance between both back gap balancing and measured section techniques. So basically, you know, gap balancing. Uh, relies on the bone cuts and uh, your measured resection uh, sorry measured resection relies on the bone cuts and gap balancing may uh, depends on your soft tissue releases any question to dr rakesh because he may have to board the flight uh, and ask one or two questions 6 minutes before my body yeah it's okay i'll yeah. take a question if somebody yeah rajiv may, may, maybe i'll ask one yeah. uh, rakesh you showed very well the measured uh, the, how, how the gap balancing is done. Now, how do you assess that your, your joint is well balanced? Um, because I, I, I do re recall very well, years back when we started the navigation, we had some tools to check the ligament tension in flexion and extension. So what is your method of checking? So uh, in, 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 in this technique, you actually have to rely on the spacer blocks. So if you can get the spacer blocks in properly, you know that you've got equal space on both sides. We don't have the ligament tensors. Uh, and uh, with this knee, still the robots have not come in. Uh, the knee, knee which you had shown was the LCS knee. And the one I have shown is the actual newer version of the LCS, which is the uh, Bishal Papa's knees. Yeah, so, one of the useful, very right, Rakesh. One of the useful methods that, that I may explain here, that one assistant is holding the thigh and the leg is being given a little bit of traction in flexion. And then when you are, you put the, uh, the, the spacer, the spacer block, and you check with the finger, the MCL tension. Now that is a reasonably good way uh, to assess the, uh, the laxity or tightness of the MCL. That, that, that district I find very useful in my case. And, uh, it's very useful, Rajiv. Uh, that's why uh, when we do like Oxford knees and all that, we do it in a hanging knee position. Right. And I think there right. is uh, also a talk about doing these sort of gap balancing knees also in a hanging leg position. 
uh, well, I think one of my friends in Ahmedabad is already doing it. He's asked me to try it, but I haven't yet been venturous enough to try that. Yet. Uh, I try all my patients that test it up by by in the hanging position. One assistant is holding the thigh, and I give the little bit of traction. Uh, Doctor Gaurav, can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, my yes, question, sir, please. To Doctor Rajiv is. Uh, you have balanced a knee and you find it is reasonably well balanced in extension and flexion but the mid flexion is loose so what is your way to take care of uh, mid flexion instability that you are detecting during surgery see the mid flexion instability is mostly in cases of fixed flexion deformity where you have a uh, you have a fixed flexion deformity and you have to cut more distal femur so in any situation where you are shifting the joint line proximally now these are the cases when you have when you encounter the significant mid flexion instability so you have to assess that this mid flexion instability is uh, can be looked after very well by maintaining the joint line that is the one one method and second is by using the you by increasing the constraint in the implant if you have a significant mid flexion instability you probably will have to choose a more constant implant. The ideal way, you know, you can <clears throat> make, increase the femoral component sizing. If suppose size three, you can go for a size four. Uh, that will give you some uh, mid flexion stability. Uh, yeah, it's but a bit, uh, uh, Subrachu, but once you've actually done the cuts uh, and you're trying with the trials, it's difficult. Uh, I don't think uh, most of the companies which we do actually provide uh, a spacer than, or a wedge uh, which will be going into the posterior condyle now. Yeah. So it, that's it, the trouble. That, so that you have to why, fill up with cement then. Yeah. You have to fill up with the cement or else you can put uh, some screw and cement a uh, little bit. You have to make adjustment or else, you know, the best way is to put augments, of course. But augments no, should be available uh, on the table. I think yeah, best uh, way is to prevent it. If you know beforehand that you have a FFD, uh, oversize the femur first before uh, yeah. beforehand itself. Uh, uh, I I agree that you have a uh, you pre uh, pre assess this in in fixed flexion deformities and if it is and significant amount of mid flexion instability is looked after by the implant itself in most of the most of the situations by by routine implants I don't mean a constrained implant but by a routine implant if you find that there is a still a instability after doing the trial reduction then probably you should increase the constraint. Because if you increase only the size of the femur, then this will also increase the, uh, reduce the flexion gap. And then this joint will become tight in flexion also. But Dr. Shubranchu has rightly mentioned that to some extent, you can manage it by that. Yeah? Usually, I ask a question. Usually, hello? Yeah, Deba. Please. Deba, Deba, please. Usually what I do is uh, after the distal cut, I usually look for, um, elevate the thigh and see for the gap on which it is uh, coming. So if we are sure that there is going to be a mid flexion instability uh, by seeing the, seeing the um, uh, gap uh, before cutting the, all the cuts, then you can decide on the size of the femur also. So before going, you have to see and be sure that there is no... Uh, uh, the gap between the extension gap and the flexion marking is uh, equal so that uh, we can decide on the size. Uh, very right, Deva. Uh, that, that only one thing is the, the, the caution that I'll address here is that be sure that increasing the femoral size, you're not having a significant reduction in the flexion space. Okay. So we can move. Another question I have. Can I have another question? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes. This is to Dr. Rajiv. Uh, Dr. Rajiv, uh, we all know that the flexion uh, ligament balancing should be very, uh, very tight on both the sides. What is your upper limit uh, for lateral laxity that you will accept? Especially if the laxity is there in extension. Uh, about 2 to 3 millimeter of lateral laxity is acceptable. Because you see that your patient is under anesthesia. So when the patient is out of the anesthesia, there will be some amount of muscle tension. 
So up to two to three millimeter is acceptable. Beyond that, it is not. And you should also be careful about what kind of implant you are using. Say, for example, if you're using a LCS knee, you cannot probably have a three millimeter laxity. There you will have to have, except one or two, uh, go between the lines of one or two millimeter. If you're using a mobile bearing, PS 150 kind of a implant that accepts about three millimeter of laxity. If you're using a fixed bearing joint, then again, three millimeter or four millimeter laxity is acceptable. But, but you're right that the accepting the laxity is it should not be too laxative, especially in a virus knee where you have a stretched, over stretched lateral collateral ligament and you have a laxity of about one centimeter or six millimeter. That is not acceptable at all because these are the cases where you will have to choose a constrained implant. What do you say, Shubhrancho, on this? Yeah, uh, I go by uh, Richard Scott principle. Suppose in a virus knee, as long as you're, if you leave the leg like that on the table, when uh, your alignment is good, so a couple of two to three millimeter laxity is acceptable. Right. So, but your alignment should be good. Yeah. It should be you know, neutral aligned. Okay. I think we'll move ahead with the next. Yeah. Sir, uh, so uh, with this uh, very informative and illustrative talk, uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Rakesh. And now I invite Dr. Subranshu Monti, sir, to deliver his talk on soft tissue release in a virus knee. So, Dr. Monti, sir. Okay. Am I audible and visible? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you, Uttaranchal Orthopedic Association uh, uh, President, Dr. Puneet Gupta, Secretary, Dr. Puneet Agrawal, and especially Dr. Gaurav Gupta for coordinating this event. And uh, I'll uh, sweep you through a couple of videos where step-by-step -step how to correct a virus knee release. I'll show you step-by-step -step, uh, and uh, not much of theory discussion, theoretical discussion on virus knee. And we have kept two lectures, like one virus knee, and then uh, Dr. Manu Jodha will uh, speak about the valgus knee release. So after the patient is anesthetized, the first thing what you need to uh, see that uh, whether there is a correctable virus or it's a not correctable virus. Sorry, video is... I'll reshare again. Now it's visible? Yes, sir. It's visible. Okay. So you have to see whether the virus is correctable or it is not correctable. Suppose in this kind of situation, uh, uh, this uh, knee is correctable and this kind of situation virus is not correctable. So whenever it is correctable, then what you can do, uh, you can do less of release and less of bone cuts when it is, uh, you know, Correctable, uncorrectable, then you have to take, uh, you know, a standard amount of bone cut what is required. There is some problem. Not able to change my slides. Okay. So whenever there is an initial exposure, what you do, you do it a periosteum, you just erase it, uh, subperiosteal elevation on the medial side of the tibia. That is the initial exposure. And uh, next you do a deep medial collateral ligament release. And usually you do a deep medial collateral ligament either with a 15 number blade or you can do with a cautery. So that is a must for each and every virus knee, whatever it is, whatever it is correctable or uh, not correctable. Next, what you do, 
My slides are moving very slowly. Can we have the next lecture ready? Then I'll just organize the things. I'll stop uh, sharing the screen. So, Manoj, can you just yeah. provide with your you lecture? I'll, in the meantime, I'll take the other. So you want me to share the screen for the welders first? Uh, yeah. yeah please. Sorry. So, is my screen visible? Sir, you, you're, you're visible, visible, Manoj. Okay, okay, thank you. So, uh, Subhanshu, I think you will take it across on the various very nicely. And uh, the first point when I speak about the Velgas, I would first try to say to all youngsters, Velgas is just not the mirror image of a Varus. When Dr. Mahanti is going to speak to you on the Varus, he will sail you through all uh, releases that happen on the tibial side. While in a Velgas, it is a femur, which is the main culprit. So we are going to talk about different conditions and how to do a simple balancing in a valgus knee. So you have to understand whether the loss is in the bone or in the soft tissues. We are dealing with a bony deformity, soft tissue or both of them. In a lot of these valgoid, you get these kind of plano valgus deformities which also need to be taken in mind subsequently for a correction because a lot of these knees can fail up. So as he was talking about the stretchable or a correctable valgus deformities, we have to see deformity lies in the bone or in the soft tissues. So deformity is mainly on the outer or the lateral side. You have a choice. We want to go in for a medial parapatellar or in certain cases where you have a very uncorrectable uh, patella lying in the lateral gutter, you can straight away go with a cablish lateral approach. So I do 99% of my knees are CR knees, which is definitely a help. In a valgus knee where you have a medial stretching of the uh, stretching of MCL because you have something like a second restraint there. So it is normally the 9 mm of section. In a valgus knee, I keep around 3 degrees of uh, valgus angle because what I want to see is I do not undercorrect these knees. So you will always have far lesser resection on the lateral side as compared to the medial side because you have hypoplastic distal femur and the posterior lateral condyle. So for the tibia, very important parameters to take the cut and the rotation. Slope, very important if you're doing a CR knee. So in all these knees, normally what you have is a tight lateral structures, stretched out medial structures. In extension, using the spreaders, cut the tight lateral structures, which is the posterior capsule and the LCL. Oh, sorry, iliotibial band. You should never ever cut the popliteus in this stage. Femur rotation is extremely important in a valgus knee. You just can't take the posterior condyle next as the benchmark. And you have to take white sides line, the trans apicular line, and the parallel to the equitable cut. All these three things in combination for a proper rotation of your femoral component. Once you do this rotation, your knees are well balanced in flexion and extension. So in majority of these knees, you will have a millimeter or so stretching on the medial side, which is okay, but should not be tolerating more on the medial side. Then you have to get back in lateral and release it so that you have equally balanced flexion extension gaps. Your patella should sit inside the femoral sulcus. If not, you have to go in for a release. The skyline shoes was a it is very good correction. So talking a bit, which is the gold standard that we do in all these is by crusting in the tight lateral structures, the ITU band and the capsule. So if it is still lax on the medial side, do not accept it out there. Go back in, identify where is the tight band. Use the 18 gauge needle or 11 number knife. Be aware you're not going to cut the nerve, the peroneal nerve, as well as do not cut the popliteus. So normally what you get is a very well balanced knee. A third case scenario, valgus with fixed flexion deformity. You have this kind of a deformity, a valgoid knee, plano valgoid foot, so you see on the knees that you can stretch it out to almost around 40 degrees. There is a definite medial laxity, tight lateral structures. You can see out here in Ranavath classification type 3. So here you can go both medial lateral. My workhorse is a medial parapatellar approach. I only use lateral if it is a subluxated uh, lateral patella or some side. So a very limited medial release in these cases. Do not go beyond the mid coronal plane. Clear the lateral gutter. You have to decompress it, take out all osteophytes on the lateral side. Release the tight structures, that patellofemoral ligament on that side. Always medialize the intramedullary rods if you're using a non-navigated surgery. 
Reject the osteophytes. See how much you're setting on the medial and the lateral side. You'll always have a hypo cutting on the lateral side because you have a hypoplastic distal femoral condyle. Once these are done, cut and release the patellofemoral ligament on the lateral side. As I told you the previously also, femur rotation is extremely important. Do not under rotate because you have a hypoplastic lateral femoral condyle. So you have to go parallel to the tibial gut in trans apicondar axis as well as perpendicular to the white sides line. All these three things are important. As told before, you have a hypoplastic posterior lateral condyle also. One of the very good markers is you should have a grand piano sign on the top. What you see out here is way higher opening on the medial side and a very tight lateral side. So as before, we are doing pie crusting of the lateral structures. Take out all osteophytes that tent out this LCL. So all osteophytes on the lateral side of the femur are taken off. Put your knees through the flexion extension arc of motion. You still have tight lateral structures. Again, going back to the pie crusting of tight structures till you have a balanced medial and lateral side in extension as well as inflection. Once this harmony is achieved, you have to now go back and address the lateral subluxation of the patella because you'll have light, tight lateral structures. So there I normally do an outside in release. Depending on the zone which is tightness, save your lateral janicular artery and keep releasing till the time a no thumb technique and your patella totally sits inside the femoral sulcus. These two things are aligned, but you still have external rotation of the tibia, which is because of the tight IT band. So here we have to identify the tight IT band. We are going to release the IT band so that the external rotation of the tibia is taken care of. So a well-balanced flexion extension gap, a very good balanced patella seating inside the trochlea and Correct the external rotation. All these three things done, your patient is walking like this on day one with a well-balanced knee in flexion and extension. Very rarely when you have a very lax MCL, that is the stage where we go in for a upsliding osteotomy on the medial side, very rarely. Or on the lateral side, if it is still tight, you do a lateral distal sliding osteotomies. In cases where despite everything you cannot correct it, you should always have the backup of constrained knees in severe well guard knees. Though in our practice, we require it in maybe one out of 500 cases. Normally, if you follow your steps well, do your corrections well, correct your knees in flexion, extension and a mid flexion ridge, have a good patellofemoral balance as well as a tibiofemoral balance, your knees can last very long. Thank you so much, and I'll be more than happy to answer any questions from the audience. Uh, thank you, Dr. Manoj. Uh, it's a very crisp and informative. Uh, so, hello. Yeah. Yes, Manoj, uh, yes, in the me meantime, when Shubrancho is setting up his talk, uh, Manoj, you have explained very well that the lateral, uh, the valgus deformities are not same as the varus deformities, very different. The two things that I find very useful in the val when, I, when I'm treating a valgus knee, one is that you, you cut the femur in less valgus. I usually take three degree valgus. Mm -hmm. And you rightly mentioned that the entry point should be, should be changed in valgus knees. The second is the rotation. Rotation of the femoral component. Most of the times, I have to increase the femoral rotation more than three degrees in most of my cases. I think that will be a very useful tip for the younger subjects. So, uh, one of the caveat uh, tricks in this to remember is, I mean, uh, learnings we have had from Dr. Ranavat during staying with him. He prefers to make an ideal table cut at 90 degrees and to have the femoral rotation parallel to the table cut. So, he says that out there in flexion, you don't have to do the releases. It's basically, you go parallel to the table cut and you would land in. And this is what Rakesh Rajput was also mentioning, which is more of a gap balancing art. But it works for a majority of the cases. You don't have to do a very extensive releases to correct your knees in flexion. Right. And the other thing that you mentioned, Manoj was right, that it is not just the bony cuts. You need to, re you need to release the lateral structures also. And, and judicious release by, by crusting. 
So, Shubranchu, in case your talk is uh, is uh, still are working with the computer, maybe we can request Dr. Devabrata Padhi to uh, take up his call, his talk. Deva, are you ready? Yeah, yeah I'm ready. So, but why don't you start, I, please? I think my, my, my talk is a uh, corollary of uh, uh, Dr. Subhranshu because it should come after that. Because he's soft tissue, mine is a bony thing. So, yeah, Dr. Gaurav, uh, since yes, Subhranshu is still working so, so working with his... Like, I think Deva, you can take up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, The flow will be on there. Yeah. Is visible? Yes, yes sir. At the, at the outset, I uh, thank the Uttaranchal Orthopedic uh, Association for collaborating with the uh, Indian Arthroplasty Association for this uh, webinar. And I thank the conveners, uh, Dr. Gupta and Dr. Uh, Subhan Chumanti for uh, allowing me to present on this topic of medial epicondylar osteotomy for severe virus. So it will be very short uh, uh, topic with video to uh, discuss some points, major points in which uh, when and uh, how we should do a medial epicondylar osteotomy. As we know, just a bit. as we know that uh, a medial epicondylar osteotomy is uh, done for severe virus, mostly intraarticular deformities, uh, which are more than 25 degree, mostly not correctable by vulgar stress on uh, after anesthesia. So any virus instability persisting after complete soft tissue release as we do as Dr. Uh, Rajiv had shown uh, that the proximal part of the tibia and uh, the postomedial part uh, is uh, released. The deep MCL and the postomedial structures are released and still we have uh, some amount of uh, instability, lateral opening up. And then uh, we uh, may need a medial epicondylar osteotomy. It prevents a superficial medial collateral release which can uh, lead to a major instability. Uh, the, uh, before going to that, uh, we should know the medial structures uh, which are there and the deep part, uh, there is the deep MCL, uh, posteriorly the posterior oblique ligament and the semimembranous and the posterior capsule on the proximal tibia attachment and in, uh, it comes from the medial uh, femoral condyle. And superficially, the uh, superficial MCL and the pace anserinus uh, are uh, lying which, uh, 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 which can cause major instability when they are released for correction of severe varex. So as we know, the superficial MCL is attached to the medial epicondyle. When you see the uh, structures attached on the medial femoral condyle, uh, there are few structures which are attached in and around a area uh, which uh, is uh, over the medial epicondyle, medial uh, condyle, femoral condyle. Uh, it may be around the medial epicondyle, the superficial MCL, then the MPFL, the adductor magnus, gastronomus, and the posterior oblique ligament are attached differently and it is away from the attachment of the medial uh, epicondyle and uh, the attachment of the superficial MCL. So uh, what uh, happens in the medial epicondylar osteotomy, the osteotomy site is usually in this area of the medial epicondyle, which uh, involves only the uh, superficial MCL and doesn't involve any of the, um, any of the other structures like the um, uh, posterior oblique ligament mostly, which is already released when, in, when it is important in this scenario, when we have a already released uh, proximal tibia, uh, deep part of the MCL and the posterior part is released. In those cases, when we go for a uh, bigger osteotomy like the slider, sliding condylar osteotomy, uh, then, uh, then uh, there may be a major uh, amount of uh, laxity. So uh, the, uh, the difference in this osteotomy and the sliding condylar osteotomy is that we avoid a uh, we can decide on the uh, osteotomy even after the release of the uh, structures from the medial uh, proximal tibia. So this is this diagrammatically shows the medial epicondylar osteotomy effect. The, a trapezoidal gap can be converted to a rectangular gap by a medial epicondylar osteotomy, uh, both in flexion and extension. It may be fixed with a screw or may not be fixed also. This is a 55-year-old lady with diabetic hypertensive which, uh, who had recovered from ischemic stroke and had normal limb uh, power at presentation, uh, 30 degree of virus, uh, uh, then FFD of 10 degree under anesthesia. It was correctable to 10 degree and uh, we decided on uh, medial epicondylar osteotomy if needed after 
release of uh, soft tissue uh, on table. So in this case, uh, uh, usually what happens even if you uh, go for a release of the medial deep part of the MCL and the posterior part of the cap posterior capsule and posterior oblique ligament and look for the gap in the flexion position, even if the extension is also lax, we see that uh, the uh, lateral is uh, loose and the medial is still tight. And in these cases, uh, if, if when you have a uh, good release, soft tissue release, and we do a, a good uh, a reduction osteotomy by lateralizing the uh, tibial plate, uh, then um, we decide on the medial epicondylar osteotomy if it is uh, uh, if it is lax after this uh, flexion um, after this flexion and extension gap. So this, uh, uh, this is the reduction osteotomy, which usually manages uh, some amount of laxity. And uh, you see that after that also, there is laxity in extension and in flexion on the lateral side. So this amount of laxity is not acceptable uh, because uh, a patient will have a um, early failure in these cases. So in those cases, uh, we go for a medial epicondylar osteotomy, as I showed in the picture, the uh, drill holes are made on the superior, anterior and the posterior superior part of the medial, in and around the medial epicondyle. And then the sharp osteotomy is taken and only partial osteotomy of the medial epicondyle is done. This, uh, re this releases the medial epicondyle partially uh, without affecting the other structures on the medial side. And this one uh, allows for guarded uh, laxity, guarded uh, uh, lengthening of the medial side without uh, um, affecting a major uh, laxity on the medial side. So uh, this is, uh, then you can see that the laxity uh, has been re uh, re recovered and uh, we, can see, we can fix it and we can leave it like that because the lower, uh, almost 30% of the, 60% of the lower part is attached uh, uh, to the soft tissue and um, uh, so uh, fixation through a screw or without uh, leaving it like that also will not affect much. So uh, finally a good uh, balanced knee is achieved. So this is the post-op x-ray with a good balanced knee. The advantage of this uh, epi epicondylar osteotomy is there is no decrease in width of the medial condyle which happens in a sliding condylar osteotomy and this is detrimental for the femoral component attachment. There, is, uh, there can be non-union in these cases, even in a sliding condylar osteotomy, but non-union in this case is well accepted because the attachment of the lower part of the epicondyle is intact and uh, there is no giveaway uh, in a normal uh, range of movement uh, of, the, um, of this patient. Screw fixation can be avoided, uh, may be needed in osteoporotic individuals, it can be done even after complete release of the deep proximal structures. Only the MCL insertion is moved, leaving all other attachments intact. Thus, uh, the, we can go ahead and do uh, a, a minimal, um, re minimal release on the medial side. So, uh, uh, gradual widening of the medial gap is possible. And in this case, uh, I will uh, just uh, tell that uh, the uh, major laxity on the lateral side cannot be achieved uh, with this type of uh, medial epicondylar osteotomy. But when you see after release that there is laxity on the, lat medial, on the lateral side, then we can go ahead and do a medial epicondylar osteotomy uh, like this. So this is another case, 69 year old lady with 20 degree virus, but uh, medial tibial subluxation, uh, which needed a medial epicondylar osteotomy uh, due to uncorrectable deformity after soft tissue release and tibial reduction. And uh, um, this is another patient, 71 year old, uh, post-traumatic uh, virus, fixed virus, 30 degree uncorrectable under anesthesia, medial epicondylar osteotomy without an implant at uh, two year follow up uh, has good range of movement and good function. The complications in this case in, uh, is a non-union, as I told, uh, there is fibrous union, which usually doesn't uh, um, affect the instability. There may be some amount of medial instability, mainly in osteoporotic individuals. Uh, there may be stiffness because of the uh, rehabilitation. Usually, 
uh, we allow two to three uh, uh, weeks, we allow only 50 degree of flexion uh, for uh, uh, the older individuals because of uh, presence of osteoporosis. And there may be implant failure if we are using a screw uh, fixation. Uh, the take home message medial epicondyl osteotomy has specific indications. The surgical skill and post op rehab uh, is important and it should not be uh, extrapolated to all cases where there it is uh, tight or there is a major laxity on the lateral side. A screw may or may not be needed, but no major instability due to intact soft tissue in and around. Uh, uh, the uh, attachment. Non-union is a possibility, but there is no instability, major instability due to that non-union. I will uh, seek support uh, from all of you uh, for the IOCON 2025 as Bhubaneswar, the Odisha Orthopedic Association is uh, bidding for it, uh, for the IOCON 2025. Uh, I will request everyone to be a member of uh, the Indian Arthroplasty Association. There are so many benefits of getting a member. You can go to the website and do it directly through the website. And uh, uh, as the next uh, uh, conference, Dr. Manoj uh, and Dr. Ramesh Sen are doing, IOCON 2023, I, I, I think uh, you should attend and be a member before that. And the next year is at Bhubaneswar and uh, it is going to be a, a, a good uh, program. Uh, and uh, uh, thank you for your patient hearing. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Deva that you invited yeah. uh, our young surgeons uh, to these wonderful meetings, the forthcoming meeting of Manoj yeah. in this year, and next year your meeting at Bhuvneshwar and the your bidding for the IOA. Very nice. Thank you so much. Deva is Sorry, good. good. So Deva, before we go on to the next, I have two basic uh, questions from your wonderful presentation, but I think that's very important for the audience to get on to these two points. A, you rightly mentioned that after doing an optimal soft tissue release, if you still have a persistent medial tightness, that's the way you go in for uh, this. So, which are the what is your threshold level where you say that I would go in for a medial apicondylar osteotomy vis a vis adding up the constraint in the implant? So, you have two options to go through. What is your uh, particular alignment in that? And then I'll get to question second. Yeah, means uh, in cases where we have an opening of, uh, say, uh, more than six millimeter to one centimeter of opening, it may not be achieved uh, with a medial, uh, limited medial epicondylar osteotomy. So in these cases, uh, we have to go ahead and uh, think of a constraint uh, implant. Wherever you are doing a severe virus knee, a constraint implant should be in the backup. And uh, some uh, company, uh, they have a constraint instra insert also, which can fit into the primary implant. So those can be uh, those can be used and those can be kept as backups uh, in uh, cases where you are in a fix, uh, whether to go for a medial epi limited medial epicondylar osteotomy like this. So your first preference is uh, osteotomy. Okay, second point for the message, when, when we slide up these, do a distal sliding osteotomy. So locating for the isometric point of this attachment is extremely important. So you would only translate it down or you have some shift happening on the anterior posterior plane also. Yeah, in that's why, that's why, uh, in this, this part is more important in this type of limited flexion, in uh, limited uh, medial epicondylar uh, osteotomy because we are not fixing, you know, because we are avoiding a fixation over there. So, and uh, we are accepting a fibrous union. So it usually settles down in a place where uh, uh, the uh, stability is maintained in extension and flexion, and it goes down and posterior. So uh, if you are fixing it in flexion and fixing it in extension, uh, it is usually um, we are fixing in a particular position, but uh, even if you fix it, better to fix it in a flexion position. Uh, Dr. Gaurav, can I can I just put a comment here? Yes, sir. Please. Thank you, uh, Deva. I think the one of the very important point about the middle epicondylar osteotomy that we must mention that the middle epicondylar osteotomy should be taken up with much more seriousness than the lateral epicondylar osteotomy. And second is that the you you need to decide whether you are going to do the osteotomy or you are going the release. If you, if you do the release, the MCL release first, 
and then go for the epidural osteotomy probably it's a better idea to be to 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 decide right in the beginning that are you going to have a epidural osteotomy or you're going to have this option to this i think i think this is very important it should not happen that you can do a significant release medially and then do the epidural osteotomy yes that's i think you will agree you will agree with me yeah, that one that one is uh, good for a sliding condylar osteotomy what we usually do for a medial side when the all the attachments of the um, on the medial femoral condyle is uh, released distally i mean it is uh, uh, going distally uh, that is important in that case because that will cause a major instability in the, those cases because this is a limited uh, osteotomy which is only done for the superficial mcl which we are not releasing in a uh, soft tissue release of the proximal tibia that is the deep mcl and the posterior medial mcl so in those cases where we are in keeping the uh, superficial mcl in the tibia intact then we can release on the proximal uh, in the distal femur uh, as a epicondylar osteotomy and that too in a guarded way uh, to achieve our uh, um, laxity on the lateral side deva i think what rajiv wants to put across as a clear message to youngsters out there right. is you have done the deep mcl release subsequent to that either you do a pie casting or needling of superficial mcl or you do an osteotomy not both rajiv i think this is what that that that, 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 that I, I, is, I, I, I think very right that and one good. more one more message dr gara if you if you allow that mm. when you are doing a medial release which i am sure that shobhranshu if his computer is uh, is again starting in the proper way he will show us that the only the deep mcl is to be released one should not release the superficial mcl and you should not touch the pes and serinus because these are the stabilizers on the medial side right after the release of the deep medial collateral ligament so it is very important that you keep the stability of the medial side intact and one who has rightly pointed at one point in valgus knee that why the the cruciate retaining implants are better Uh, because at least the uh, the pcl is giving some amount of stability in flexion is it right manoj that, that's yeah. what you mentioned that yeah. Yeah. additional restraint when you are releasing on yeah. other side a central additional restraint is there to yeah. sort of cover up for the laxities you have and i think a very nice question has been put on by rakesh that where you would accept a lateral tightening and where you would go in for a medial opening rakesh has put it on the chat box Deva, it's for you. Rakesh has put up yeah. in the chat box. Where would you look going for a lateral up slide, and where you would go in for a medial down slide? Yeah, but I have no, I have no experience in the uh, proximalization of the medial epicondyle. But if you are planning a proximal uh, medial um, proximalization of the medial ep uh, epicondyle, we have to do a sliding condylar osteotomy. We cannot do like this. so uh, then we have to do a sliding condylar osteotomy and proximalize it so i have no experience in that i think dr rajiv has experience in that yeah when you do a medial epicondylar osteotomy and proximalize it that means that you are tightening the mcl now these are the cases where the mcl is stretched already but for that it is very important that the mcl remains efficient it is not a loose mcl which you can just push it proximally because in in that kind of a situation where the mcl is not having the 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 is not a intact mcl anymore so there the shifting the mcl proximally will not help and i think in the, in the wherever you are in doubt probably you should go for the constrained implant which is very very important because and as much you play on the lateral side it is much more easier so i would play personally more on the lateral side lateral epicondyle osteotomy shifting it proximally to tighten the lateral collateral ligament or distalizing it to release the lateral collateral ligament say for example in situations of uh, of valgus knee uh, shubhranchu uh, are you ready with your talk now uh, yeah yeah dr devrat a question one question yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, whenever we do uh, this uh, tight varus knee in a very osteoporous bone, there is some time uh, avulsion of the medial epicondyle in the last reduction, and you are stuck. This is a kind of auto sliding osteotomy. It's, it's, no, there is not complete sometimes, but you uh, fix like to fix it always, or you just leave it 
if there is slight avulsion and it so the, uh, gets this is uh, this is uh, yeah the dr garov the nice question this one actually uh, this uh, epicondyle osteotomy is what we are doing in a guarded way and mm -hmm. what has been done inadvertently while doing a uh, tight virus knee what you are telling so that yeah, one especially in osteoporotic bone and yeah, when osteoporotic you... individual usually in osteoporotic individuals and so you in osteoporotic ha uh, osteoporotic individuals it is better to uh, fix it with washer and mm -hmm. uh, um, have a guarded uh, rehabilitation protocol initial 2 to 3 weeks we usually um, ask for 50 degree of flexion not more than that so that the uh, strain on the medial side is uh, balanced soft tissue healing is uh, good and then we can increase on the flexion okay uh, kishi dr gaurav sure. if i may take up your question yes uh, sir the uh, the if you have a accidental uh, avulsion of the middle of the middle epicondyle mm -hmm. uh, from femur if the fragment is big enough to take mm -hmm. up a screw what deva is said very right that screw mm -hmm. with a washer is washer. a very good option but you mm -hmm. must keep in your in your operation theater i'll suggest that all our younger colleagues that keep the anchor sutures ready at least one or two anchor sutures uh, mm -hmm. uh, ready in the in the operation theater because that comes very handy in this kind of a situation if the fragment is very small it is not fixable by the screw mm -hmm. then probably just just fix up the one or two anchor sutures and fix it up it works very well and give the protected weight bearing for a period of 3 weeks to 4 weeks Rajiv, I have a personal viewpoint. In all these uh, various knees where you have a medial sort of a avulsion, the message for youngsters should be they should always fix it up, either with the screw and washer or with sutures, because yeah. this subsequently leads to mid flexion instability later on. So I, I agree. So we're working at that time then to leave it for future, because if, in an osteoporotic bone, if it doesn't heal, that's a devastation to address, and you will jumping over to a very high level of a constraint to solve that. Uh, absolutely right it should not be left as such it should be addressed for sure yeah. okay thank you okay. so now we move on to the last presentation uh, it was supposed to be uh, a pre, uh, should, uh, earlier in the queue but because of some technical problem dr subranshu is now going to present his uh, uh, talk on uncorrectable varus knee release so with this sir uh, dr subranshu sir Yeah, uh, please uh, start. Thank now. you, thank you very much. Sorry for the trouble. So whenever you start, a, you know, for the young colleagues, that uh, whenever you start a total knee replacement, first you do a varus knee, and so you need to know the step by step, uh, you know, uh, uh, procedure that how to go for releasing a varus knee. So first thing, what you check, you examine the patient or the anesthesia and see whether it is a correctable varus or it is an uncorrectable varus. so if it a correctable varus then you have to do a less of soft tissue release and less of bone cuts compared to a you know uncorrectable varus where you have to do a standard bone cuts and do a gradual release so i'll show you through couple of videos that how to go about it now the first thing whenever there is a you know, varus knee what you do superiorly elevate the you know structures from the upper part of medial side of the tibia and that is the part of your exposure so that in each and every case you need to do do next you release the deep medial collateral ligament normally i do a 15 number blade but you can use a cautery also the deep medial collateral ligament usually it is released in each and every case next the third step is that you have to take out the osteophytes address this osteophytes in the early part of your surgery so you can do it with a nibbler or take an osteotomy with a hammer first i take out the tibial osteophytes next i take out the femoral osteophytes because anyway you are going to take it out uh, so take it out earlier part of the surgery so that you do have to do less of soft tissue release leading to less of instability and remember that whenever you are taking out the osteophyte from the lower part of the femur there be careful about the medial collateral ligament because there the attachment of medial collateral ligament is there you may inadvertently while doing the osteotomy you, have, you may in your uh, injured the medial collateral ligament attachment there next you have to take out the meniscus remnants because whatever the meniscus also taking out the meniscus helps you to correct the deformity to certain extents finally after doing this much release roughly estimate how much correction you have achieved now 
you do the extension of the knee and see that if you are achieved a good correction, whether the knee is going to be until at least about neutral, then you do not have to do much of uh, soft tissue release now. Next, we'll do the rest of the releases when uh, we are putting the trial components in. Now, I do normally a you know, posterior cruciate sacrificing process in all my cases. So I release the posterior cruciate ligament uh, before doing further balancing because posterior cruciate ligament also plays an important role in the deformity formation. But if you are doing a cruciate retaining knee, then you have to just release the posterior cruciate ligament adequately so that you achieve a good balancing. Next, I take the TBL cut first. So normally if there's a defect in the tibia, I tend to take about uh, you know eight millimeter or so tibia from the unaffected side. And whatever defect is remaining, then you can address it later on because you may require a reduction osteotomy where the defect will be taken out or you may have to build up the defect. So put your uh, TBL jig, Normally, we use an extra medullary jig and then take the whatever amount of TBI you want to take. As I told you, in a correctable virus, again, very less amount of TBI you have to take, maybe four to six millimeter. And if there's a use osteophytes and uncorrectable virus, you may have to take also less amount of TBI. So after taking the tibial you know, cut, now this much defect is remaining. And as you can know, I always measure that how much TBI I have taken. So here about seven millimeter of tibia has been taken. I'm not taking too much of tibia now because that may lead to more of instability or we may have to put a bigger spacer there. Finally, now I have to do a reduction of osteotomy of the tibia while preparing the tibia. So I take out the posteromedial capsule from the medial part of the tibia and go on to posteromedial aspect and release the semi-membranous which is attached to the superior margin of posterior condyl, posterior part of the medial condyle of the tibia, so that I do a reduction of osteotomy. So here we are doing a reduction of osteotomy, or, uh, and uh, if you do a reduction of osteotomy, that also corrects the virus uh, deformity to a certain extent. So after doing a reduction, as you can see, the defect has reduced to a greater extent and just whatever is remaining, either you can build up with the cement or a screw and a cement. And finally, the knee was tight. So finally, I do a superficial medial collateral ligament and this is pie crusting of the supramedial cholesterol, superficial MCL. We do it a 18 gauge needle and do it a couple of times, maybe 10 to 15 times, then again check that how much you stretch it out and again check and uh, then again do 10, 15 times. So do it repeatedly so that uh, till your knee gets balanced. Previously you used to do subperiostal elevation of the superficial medial collateral ligament. Nowadays we are avoiding and we replaced with this, uh, you know, uh, pie crusting of superficial medial collateral ligament. Now, while Superiorly, if you elevate inadvertently, you may take out that there may be release of the superficial MCL leading to gross instability. Moreover, it used to give a lot of uh, soft tissue injury there, so hematoma formation, and patient used to get a lot of post-operative pain. So this spike crusting has helped us to a greater extent, uh, and uh, we are not doing any more superiorly elevation of the superficial MCL. Finally, in usually some of the cases where there is a Mediolateral, you know, subluxation, as you can see in this type of cases, finally you can do a popliteus release. The popliteus becomes tight in this kind of cases. And especially while doing a trial reduction, you will see that is a little tightness in the flexion and the polyethylene is just giving way. And in the, those kind of cases, in the posterolateral corner, you see the popliteus tendon and do a pie crusting of the popliteus tendon, again taking a 18 gauge needle, so, and again, you stretch it out so that uh, you know the virus knee gets balanced. And again, finally, you check that after putting your trial prosthesis, your knee is balanced, medial lateral it is stable, alignment is neutral, and your flexion and extension gap is maintained, and there is no instability both in flexion and extension. And if you have got a too much of a virus deformity, which is not correct with all these techniques. Uh, then, you know, of course, you may require a pace and sinus release or advancement of the lateral collateral ligament. As we are discussing in Deborah's talk that uh, he is doing release of the medial collateral ligament. Here you can do an advancement of the lateral collateral ligament. And when you use this, uh, then you can take the 
lateral con epicondylar release and then fix it in the little proximal direction. And in those kind of cases, if you are doing, then you may require constant knees because that will lead to gross instability. So to conclude, dear friends, so while releasing initially, you have to release the deep medial collateral ligament, take out the osteophytes from both femoral side and tibial side early in your surgery. I release the posterior cruciate ligament. Since I do a posterior cruciate substituting design, you may balance by partially releasing the PCL. Then you release the posterior medial capsule and semimembranosus and do a reduction of osteotomy in the tibial flare. And finally, I release the, do a pie crusting of the superficial medial collateral ligament. And if still in tight, then finally I do a pie crusting of the popliteal tendon. And of course, pace and sinus Pensacinus and advancement of the lateral collateral ligament is extremely rare in my practice. And if you require this thing, then you may have to put a constraint in there. I thank you for a patient hearing. Thank you, sir. Uh, it's a nice informative talk. Uh, so, uh, sir, one question. Uh, yeah. Uh, in your sequence of release, PCL comes very early, means uh, for, I think you are a PS surgeon mostly. Yeah, yeah. So for the CR surgeon, uh, those who are doing mostly CR, just like uh, Dr. Manoj Vadva is doing mostly CR. So uh, whenever there's a tight varus deformity, it's not getting balanced with normal medial soft tissue release and reduction of me. So um, uh, with retaining the PCL, is sometimes difficult. So how we do we manage with the CR knee in a tight virus situation? So, no. so in these cases, I think one of the points I would like to add up, it's normally what you have to look in, there is no tenting of MCL for the posteromedial osteophytes beneath the MCL. You need to shave those portions off. Similarly, when you go into and you do a thorough notch plasty, because PCL is normally tended on an osteophyte that you cannot see because you are working on the posterior aspect, but what you see the notch, there are osteophytes renting the PCL and that PCL is also causing additional tightness. So decompression of your PCL is extremely important. If you decompress your PCL well, it works. Then you have to identify which is the tight bundle of the PCL. It's not that you have to release the entire PCL. Many times one bundle is tight, you have to look in that, okay, when I try to bend it around at 90 degrees, only then I have a tight on tightness on the medial side. So that selective bundle has to be released rather than the entire PCL. So yes, definitely for any complex various deformity where you use amount of osteophytes and you're not able to correct, you should always have a backup of a PS. But once you start doing a technique to a high volume, you will realize that you hardly ever require that a backup to be used. Sir, whenever you are in doubt whether the PCL is uh, functioning or not, so you... Uh, uh comes to a CS knee or um, kind of thing? No, I, would uh, to a, I would move to a PS knee in those cases. Uh, when we have used initially those uh, anterior stabilized knees and uh, those one um, lift inserts. But I think leaving it across onto the plastic, I would not leave it. And then I would move into a PS in those cases. Though okay. my initial five years of practice, I only used to use, as you rightly saying, the lip inserts to circumvent those situations and being sort of fixed up in my idea. No, no, I'll stick on to a CR. But today, I think doing mega thousands of those, I would say if your PCL is stressed out, it is incompetent, there is no harm in moving on to a PS. So you don't so, uh, uh, trust on CS knee. I mean, you don't uh, do CS. You do only CR or PS on. Yeah, CR, very rarely if I have to move on, it will be PS in my practice. Okay. Yeah, uh, if I may comment here, uh, yes, one of you rightly mentioned just now that the if there is an instability, then it is rather than leaving the, the, the poss possibility of instability uh, to a poly, it is better to change it to, to the PS design. I, I think that's a very important message. And the second thing is that in a, in a virus knee, uh, most important message that uh, Shubhranchu wanted to give was that the posterior medial corner is the most important part. Now, that should be released sufficient. Like in virus ni posterior medial and in valgus ni posterior lateral. So yeah. your focus has to be there on those situations. So the sir, other question is uh, you just mentioned uh, pyricasting of uh, popliteus in a 
uh, as a last resort means uh, in a tight virus situation so how it helps means uh, uh, you know <laughs> the, yeah, yeah i could get it see the knee is something like this Hmm. so you'll see in some of the x rays in you know very delayed cases it is subluxated medio laterally hmm. you know popliteus is attached to upper part of posterior part of the tibia and uh, then in uh, you know, a muscular origin and tendinous insertion into the lateral epicondyle okay hmm. so when hmm. knee is subluxated like that popliteus gets contracted for a long time the patient is maintaining in this position hmm. those are the kind of cases you think of uh, doing popliteus at a last resort so that mm. in popliteus release your knee will be balanced in you know, a medial laterally like this so okay. there only you release popliteus even you can do a little partial release with a quatri i do mm. it a 18 gauge needle some people also do with the quatri or it a 15 number blade you can uh, release the first popliteus russia i can add on a point here so you're talking in terms of the patients who have uh, lateral subluxation and walk with a valgus thrust those yeah. are the total cases yeah yeah so uh, there is one point i normally do it rather than releasing the popliteus you just identify and transect the popliteal fibular ligament you don't have to cut the popliteus very right but identifying the popliteal fibular ligament is is a little yeah, tricky you have to little work it the challenge okay. that saves you from yeah. cutting off the popliteus which is still yes. a good stabilizer in flexion well, right but it doesn't matter if in a popliteus uh, post operatively we have not seen any of the problems of in a gross instability or something like that but one should not release the popliteus in a valgus knee one should avoid releasing in a valgus right. popliteus but that will lead to gross instability so many times we have uh, injured the popliteus during the <laughs> different cuts so it doesn't uh, uh, doesn't affect much in the virus knee. sometimes rarely in very small knees whenever size one tibia or something like that whenever you take the cut uh, there is a possibility of uh, you know injuring the popliteus also it has happened uh, twice thrice uh, with me but uh, it doesn't affect post operatively <laughs> ultimately So that we don't uh, see but, that but my, my feeling is shubhranchu that the uh, popliteus is a important stabilizer in flexion yeah for yeah. the message to the youngsters is that as much as possible popliteus should not be damaged in a, in a in a routine knee yeah. Yeah. and very specific condition what you explained uh, where you have a subluxated knee fe fe femur over tibia these are the very specific cases where a pipe thrusting can be done right thank you so much if there is no other questions i think uh, dr gaurav uh, yes, move sir. on to the cases um uh, so uh hmm so there is a there is not much cases from the panelist uh, so i would like to discuss one case with the um, all eminent faculty here uh so have, i am sharing my screen yeah yeah i am sharing my screen so while dr gorov is sharing the screen uh, let me just uh, i have one question uh, subhranshu with you yeah if you if you release everything uh, how much time uh, or how much you can uh, accept tibial varus in a tight varus knee usually you know i am a person who goes for a mechanical alignment so i leave it in the neutral alignment but you can leave around uh, you know 2 to 3 degree of varus uh, residual varus uh, that doesn't matter as long as your joint is stable the most important thing is joint stability has to be maintained 
so nowadays we have you know kinematic alignment restricted kinematic adjusted mechanical all those things has come into picture so more or less we have uh, you know solved the issue of alignment the problem is the stability if you leave the joint unstable that is going to be painful and that is going to fail earlier uh, as long as uh, you know doesn't matter whether new mechanical alignment neutral mechanical alignment or couple of degrees of bias thank you and one prof, one question from my side sir uh, dr subranshu yeah uh, you are when you are doing a reduction osteotomy uh, yeah. so uh, means uh, how much you are uh, how much you uh, trust on um, reducing the size of the tibia rather than putting a wedge or a graft means uh, if you have a bigger defect so what is the threshold means you use a graft or you fill with the metal or you just reduce it the maximum uh, no, no, no. Let, let it. just if if your size of the tibia is a size 3 one size you can reduce okay mm -hmm. and uh, one size you can reduce and you can see that what is the flare of the tibia how much the flare because of the deformity of the varus deformity the flare as uh, uh, is there that flare you have to reduce and uh, whenever after taking the reduction osteotomy after doing that if you see the defect is uh, say within 5 mm or so you can just build up with multiple rolls and the cement and if it is uh, 5 to 10 or 12 then you can do a screw put uh, one or two screws and then build up with the cement screw cement but if it is beyond that more than 10 mm or so then you may have to put a graft uh, there and if you're putting a graph to upload that, uh, you need to put a stem extender uh, to upload that graph. And uh, it while you are putting a screw and the cement, uh, mm -hmm. then whether to use a stem extender or not, it depends that uh, what percentage of the you know, TBL surface uh, the defect is there. Suppose it is within 20% of the surface of the TBL, then you may not put a stem extender, but it will be beyond 20% of the surface of the TBL, the defect is there, then uh, I would put a stem extender there also. And moreover, if there is porotic bones, osteoporotic bones, then uh, uh, if your TBL component is not very stable, the trial component, there I put a stem mm -hmm. extender uh, uh, for, the, for the stability, additional stability. Okay. Um, so you, you use more of a graft uh, than wedges or metal? Yeah. To fill the defect. Yeah. Usually, young patients, you put grafts because the barrels knee, usually a good bone stock is there. Uh, if it's an old patient, then you can use wedges and the, uh, you know, the augments. But the thing is that uh, those are the usually in primary knee, it is not there on the table. But if you have, you can use all those things. Nowadays, segmental defects are better filled with uh, sleeves and the cones rather than putting the wedges and uh, hemi blocks so now almost we have stopped using hemi blocks and wedges we are using a sleeves because that provides a better metaphysical fixation um, a metaphysical diaphysical fixation okay so sir is my screen visible to yeah yeah good so sir, there's a case uh, it's a 77 year old female patient uh, hypertensive non diabetic and the bilateral TKI surgery was done in 2011 for OA with valgus deformity. And used to complain of pain and instability at knee joint and used to take support while walking after the surgery throughout his uh, throughout her uh, uh, around uh, 7 or uh, 8 or 10 year of follow-up. Uh, means the knee was not uh, stable uh, completely. So she used to take support while walking. So she had a fall after a sleep in August 22 at home and presented with a distal femur fracture. So this, these are her uh, uh, pre-injury uh, uh, x-rays and that, were the, that was the status of the knee joint after TKR and looks uh, pretty okay, means a slight valgus uh, in the left side and that was a fracture. So the fracture was uh, uh, um, quite distal, type 3, kind of, uh, and this is a CT scan. 
and in cities can pass quite comminuted so about this case i would like to ask the um, panelist that uh, what are the options means uh, when you uh, would you like to fix it and rehab or going to replace it um, as a uh, sure. Dr. Gaurav, before we decide that what is the fixation method, let us try to read the pre-operative right, or immediately post-operative x-rays. Can you go back to your slide? Yes, sir. So the, these the, are before, these before are, fracture. Before so if fracture. We ass, if you assess this x-ray, now one thing is very clear that the bone is very osteoporotic. The surgeon has used multiple screws on both the sides. So that means that this patient had a severe osteoporosis as well. The second, you rightly mentioned that there is a lot of, there has been complaint of in this, uh, unstable knee. Uh, am I right? Yes, sir. The knee was yeah. not yeah. stable. Um, yeah, so knee was not stable. And when you see the post-fracture x-ray, it shows clearly that there is a significant amount of comminution. Mm -hmm. I think these are the factors which are very important to, uh, this in deciding uh, what is to be done next for this patient. So and also you? one more thing that I will mention here, it is very important to know how the other knee is doing, other mm -hmm. operated knee. Is she comfortable? Is she strong on the other knee? It will be far, your, your decision has to be based on all these factors. Yes, so the knee, the other knee is uh, slightly less uh, troublesome. She is managing walking on the other knee. Uh, this knee was not that much stable and had some valgus orientation and slight opening medially uh, when she is used to walk. So that uh, left knee was uh, unstable since uh, uh, the index surgery. Uh, but the right knee is doing good. Right knee, she has less complaint. So the rest so here process done. is almost uh, very simply laid down as algorithm. Now, A, we need to have a CT scan to 3D CT scan to assess what is the kind of bone stock that is available. I'm doing a similar case tomorrow morning, just a similar case. I'm just starting on. So, you are talking of an octogenarian, 75 years plus, which is very osteoporotic, also, also has an impairment of index surgery. You definitely have to keep a fixation option with you on table. But I think the thrust and the bias would be in this case to move in and do a distal femur replacement and let her walk the same day rather than keeping thinking of multiple plates, which more or less uh, with our experience is going to fail in this case. Though the CT scan reconstruction you have to see in a 3D, not just one slide that we can see on, but it looks like totally shattered and fragmented. So in those cases, fixation normally does not last in a type 3 kind of a fracture. Uh, especially the patient has a problem knee since... Uh... Uh, uh, the index surgery and she used uh, I think the file the fall might be just because of instability uh, she used to right. walk with support and a lot of limb uh, right. so fix so in my view just fixing the fracture and retaining the implant and, and going with the same kind of knee uh, having some instability may not work for her uh, so yeah, I mean instability is another issue, of course. Suppose the <laughs> would not have been stable, would have been stable also in this kind of cases. What uh, Dr. Manuj is telling that you know because there is no bone stock distally, it mm. would not be ideal to fix it uh, rather than uh, you know in a patient who is seventy-seven years old is better to replace it. Well, first thing that uh, in this kind of osteoporotic bones, what uh, as Rajiv was pointing out that uh, I have a low threshold of uh, putting a stem extender. I would put a stem extender both on femoral and tibial side uh, in this kind of osteoporotic bones. While doing um, the primary surgery? Primary mm -hmm. surgery, yeah. yeah. It, it, no, I do a lot of hemophilia patients and all these hemophilia patients have got a lot of osteoporosis. Even in a straightforward knee, I put a, you know, for a safety set, put a stem extender on either side. Because of severe osteoporosis, uh, otherwise they land up this kind of you know, supraconello fracture with a, you know simple fall also with a uh, less uh, uh, you know impact of the trauma. And looking at this case, <laughs> second case that uh, because of the severe combination here, uh, mm -hmm. uh, before doing CT scan, 
always I take a traction X-ray to see the bone stock. So mm -hmm. when the patient comes to casualty, immediately to assess the bone stock, you do a traction X-ray, both AP mm -hmm. and lateral view. And of course, mm -hmm. you have to do a CT scan to assess the bone stock. And uh, if the bone stock is not there, then they, uh, of course, uh, the distal femoral replacement is the only option. Type C is so similar. Type C, yeah. yeah. So though we have we have good uh, uh, locking plate for the fixation, but sometimes it is not possible to uh, get the proper bone stock and a good healing uh, potential. Um, so I just did a same thing. Um, I did a extended uh, this uh, approach and uh, just when I assessed the fracture and the implant, the implant was a little loose. The femoral implant was uh, uh, moving. Um, it was not, uh, loose. So when I removed the, the, yeah. the whole implant, there was a very minimal bone left. Uh, and the tibia came out uh, as a as a, there was no cement uh, sticking on the tibial base plate, so it was also maybe not very uh, well fixed. So, she, so, so, Dr. Gaurav, before we go ahead with your what you did, let mm -hmm. us give the message to our uh, to our viewers mm -hmm. that a uh, very important thing that you mentioned in this case that one that this the instability. Instability in the joint, uh, unstable TKR may result in an easy injury and a fracture. Osteoporotic yes. bone has to be managed well. As Shibranshu rightly mentioned, that is better to take care of that these patients are stable joints and if needed, extend, extension stem is used. And also, thirdly, the cementing. It is not enough that you just put the cement. The cement has to have a good bonding with the bone and the implant. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. So, uh, thanks for your valuable comments, sir. Uh, then I put a hinge distal femoral uh, replacement processes. Um, it's a uh, Astrom hinge uh, implant. And uh, this is the final post of x rays. So, so the. So patient is standing the next day, full weight bearing, walking, having a good movements also, bending up to the up to seventy degree easily, and this was the case. This 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 is how I manage the case. So with uh, Dr. Gaurav, it's a well done case. Uh, can we go back to your post operative X ray? So these are the X rays. Right. So, uh, can I ask you here mm. that you, this is the mega processor with the extension uh, attached yeah, to is, this? Yeah, ASROM hinge processes. Uh, right. This is right. LPS. This is LPS. Uh, 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 right. But, but uh, did you need to use such a large, uh, did you need to do the osteotomy to such a large extent? Or could you have reduced it for some reason? Or you, you have done it uh, for some... No, sir. Uh, I didn't do. Uh, I didn't extended the osteotomy. Means uh, uh, that much the, the the fracture was extending up to okay. that part, and okay. Uh, okay. I just removed the the fractured bone. And in fact, uh, the bone here was very thin. That's why this circular bar is also there. While hammering, right. it, it was getting it was getting shattered, uh, having a splinter. So I just uh, put some circular wires, and. Uh, so that was a so that's available. a prophylact prophylactic wiring also can be done before the yeah you can do a prophylactic wiring the minimum size of the uh, you know this distal femoral replacement is about 70 mm so 70 mm you have to do anyhow if it is beyond mm -hmm. that then you have to add extra augments and extra augments consist of 25 millimeters each yeah so, there is a so, length so, so that is that is why you use the extender very rightly ah, yeah. and what size of the stem you used here uh stem size of the stem uh, sir uh, i don't remember exactly but it was uh, the uh, minimum uh, available length and dia means the bone was not having much of the canal 
means the canal was not very wide and uh, the cement is partially uh, the, the stem is partially cemented and uh, so yeah my comment here is that the stem if it is possible should be 10 millimeter or more because in a in a younger patient especially if you are using because this patient will use the implant for a more number of years and around 8 to 10 years a thinner stems they tend to fracture uh, and and the second thing is that cementing of this stem is very important it should be done uh, it should be a very well cemented stem Mm. That's just a comment here. And yeah. if possible, and if possible at the junction of the bone and the implant, you can put some grafts, whatever bone you have excised, you can put it at the junction of the neuropod because that junction of the stem, uh, the distal femoral prosthesis and the bone, mm. because there is a 10 millimeter ring there, which mm. is uncemented, it's coated. coated. Put put it. It. So there, if you put graft, there's a possibility of bone on growth there and that may lead to better stability. Yes, sir. It's a well so done case. So let us see your result. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So patient is walking. I is uh, around uh, one year of follow-up I have. So this is the immediate follow-up pictures, two weeks post-op. So patient is having uh, up to the 70 degree of flexion and full extension able to walk normal so uh, the 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 late follow up pictures i don't have right now uh, but she is walking uh, just just think of uh, suppose it fractures at the head tip of the stem what will do next uh, so <laughs> sir i told her that you please don't fall again i will not be able to manage <laughs> <No>. <laughs> i i think that these are the cases which should be subjected to uh, terry parotide, proper calcium, vitamin D, and the fall protection regime that they should be very careful uh, regarding the future fall. Treat, treat osteoporosis always. <coughs> yeah. 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 Yes, very sir. right. It's an excellent case. Yeah. For Thank all you, of these uh, distal femur fractures, uh, the take home message should be we should first look for the stability of the implant. Before mm -hmm. that, uh, when the implant is stable or it is uh, loose, that two, decide. Two, yeah, two things uh, bone stock and uh, implant stability. There are two things you have to uh, yeah. decision. So bone stock, if it is good, the implant is stable, go for a fixation. The bone stock is not good, stability is not there. Of course, you have to go for a revision and put a. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Gaurav. It's a wonderful thing. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Yeah. So, and any more case we have? No, sir. We don't have any uh, more case now. Uh, uh, so, any any questions in the chat box? Uh, just a minute, sir. There is a very important question from Rajput that uh, the common peroneal now palsy releasing MCL to balance the uh, loose lateral collateral ligament may cause uh, common peroneal nerve palsy. At least uh, I have not seen in my practice anytime common peroneal nerve palsy in a virus knee. Mm -hmm. Valgus knee, tight valgus knee, those are, uh, you know, fixed valgus knees, not correctable. Uh, those kind of cases may land up in the lateral popliteal palsy. But uh, virus knees, uh, we have never seen. I would second yeah. you, Shubhranshu. I, I agree with you, Shubhranshu, that I have no, never seen this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it has been a wonderful webinar. Uh, and mm -hmm. uh, I think our time is up, Shubhranshu. What do you say? Yeah. 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 Uh, if any other questions, uh, no other questions, then uh, before we close, at least uh, let me just have a humble request to you, all the mm -hmm. members of the Uttaranchal Orthopedic Association, for your kind support for my endeavor for the Vice President post of Indian Orthopedic Association elections this year. We had a nice, uh, wonderful meeting at Dehradun this year. Mm -hmm. I had attended that and uh, beautiful meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gaurav, for this uh, wonderful webinar along with mm -hmm. IAA. So IAA now, uh, uh, Dr. Rajiv is the chairman of orthoplasty section of IOA. 
and mm. we have been conducting webinars uh, along with uh, different uh, associations like state mm. association this is with mm. uttaranchal then we will be doing with other state associations also and we will be putting up all these recordings in our website and also youtube channel one can see anytime even i also see before doing any case one of these webinars which have done maybe one year back and uh, some the first webinar we started with dr manoj wadwa balgasni so if you go through it again if you just uh, listen it you will get very very minute important points which has been discussed in the webinar which will be helpful in the practice so i would recommend that to go through these webinars again in your leisure and uh, see that uh, what are the things has been discussed this is just ready recognition thank you very much thanks uh, uh, thank you shubhranchu and you. i will also uh, request the viewers those who are not already the members of the indian arthroplasty association should become uh, one by going to the uh, website of the indian arthroplasty association and there are very various very good meetings coming up uh, the next uh, webinar is on 28th that is the indian orthopedic association and indian arthroplasty association on the uh, tkr in valgasni uh, then after uh, uh, there is a very interesting meeting coming up in october of asia pacific arthroplasty society in uh, cebu uh, philippines uh, and also the meeting of uh, manoj uh, the indian arthroplasty association 2023 meeting and then after our annual meeting of the indian orthopedic association uh, th thank you so much dr gaurav thank you uh, thank you sir and i thanks to all the faculty to uh, take uh, spare some is the, this valuable time from their busy practice and i especially thank dr mohanthi and he took all the efforts and he came to dehradun to attend our meeting annual meeting and uh, it was wonderful to have you here sir and uh, um, this webinar is also uh, dr mohanthi has made special efforts to organize it and to make it possible so sir uh, definitely at uh, from uttarakhand orthopedic session we are uh, going to be with you in, throughout your election and uh, and campaign and uh, i thank dr manoj dr uh, uh, rajiv sharma dr devrat and dr rakesh rajput uh, they spared time from their very busy schedule so that was a very wonderful uh, meeting with nice talks very informative so that with that i thank you all once again and close this webinar thank you thank you thank you gaurav thank you so much thank, thank you. you good night thank you good night thank you good night thank you, thank you so much uh, punam can we uh, go offline now uh, punam from ortho tv you can stop recording and uh, mm -hmm. right you can stop live streaming now